Since my very first childhood boner, I've been trying to figure out a way to get my eyes on a set of uncensored tits. But starting puberty in a sexually conservative household in the late 90s at the age of 12, the sight of a topless woman was beyond elusive. Online porn was too nascent and risky, especially for a shy, well-behaved, and God-fearing boy. I was the kind of kid with an unblemished report card who got called a brown nose by my peers while being asked to do their homework. My friend's moms all trusted me because I was too afraid to lie or break a rule. For most of my childhood, I thought that my parents were always watching me, especially my father, who became enraged at even a hint of a lie. And then, there was a cloud daddy version of God over me all the time. So my best shot for seeing some hooters was at sleepovers with friends who dared to turn on the scrambled segments of late night TV erotica. <laughs> Given my law abiding nature, instead of looking at the screen, I neurotically waited to hear the sounds of footsteps from my friend's parents. And when I did watch, my odds of correctly guessing that I was seeing a second of a knocker on the Name That Body Part game was just as likely as a butt cheek or elbow or ball sack. <laughs> that was after patiently getting through a scene listening to a plumber determined to lay some pipe or a delivery boy showing up with, you know, a special sausage pizza. <laughs> For some continuous color cleavage, the best I could do was watch an R-rated movie with my parents that featured a sex scene. For example, there was a time I joined them on a date to the movies to see Shakespeare in Love. Squir squirming in my seat, I sneaked in a shot of a topless Gwyneth Paltrow between the spaces of my fingers covering my flushing face. But my luck for seeing some boobs was about to change. Just before heading to middle school, my parents booked me a trip to Toronto to visit my savvy scientist uncle Shia. Soft-spoken yet punchy, Shia always cracked jokes and never missed a moment to tease me. From as early as I remember, Shia would tell me about his collection of magazines filled with topless women, the twins on full display, and that was a major step up for my mom's latest Victoria's Secret catalog. <laughs> the point of the trip, my parents told me, was to visit Shia's lab at the hospital and see if research piqued my interest enough to be considered for a career down the line. However, from the second I left my parents at the airport gate, my mind shifted to one thing and one thing only, and that was a sea of uncensored boobs. <laughs> For the roughly five hour flight, I mulled over how to ask Shia if I could see a pair, but I never had to ask my uncle anything. The first time I used the bathroom in Shia's apartment, I found an organized pile of magazines next to the sink. Eagerly, I picked up the one sitting on top. Sports Illustrated. Undoubtedly a classic, but it wasn't even a swimsuit edition. So I swapped it out with the next one in the pile and the next one until I picked up a one that read Playboy. Jackpot. <laughs> the world melted around me, bell towers rang, horns triumphantly sounded, heavenly voices sang, fireworks erupted inside. The grand moment had finally <laughs> come. All I had to do now was flip open the magazine. So I double checked the lock on the door and proceeded to take the longest fake shit of my life. <laughs> I shuffled through pages, etching a cornucopia of cans into my memory. After no who knows how long, I heard my name being called with growing intensity. Shia was calling out for me, saying that my parents were on the line waiting to speak with me. My uncle's stack of Playboys, however, was not the kind of sightseeing or career-related information I would be able to report back home. <laughs> Clumsily, I reassembled the pile of magazines, then I opened the faucet and patted my face with some cold water, pleading for my heart on to go away. <laughs> my mind raced to take the wind out of the erection at full mast. I straightened my clothes and ran out of the bathroom to, to the phone where my uncle stood with a giant, proud smirk. <laughs> with a smooth wink, and an elbow bump, he said, how was the bathroom? <laughs> Shaking, I grabbed the corded phone, a sweat growing on my forehead. Somehow I navigated that call, 
recounting going to Shia's lab, where he drew some blood from his arm, placing a few red drops onto a slide to be examined under a microscope. But that was not the most memorable moment of that trip. Uh uh. That trophy goes to when, at the end of the trip, my uncle dropped me off at the airport for my flight home. Before hugging me to say goodbye, he turned me around, unzipped my backpack, and slid in a package. My fingers were crossed that I had just scored my own first Playboys. But I was so scared that the X-ray machines would see right through me and my bag. <laughs> so once through security, I rushed into the nearest restroom with my heart shooting into my throat. I hurried into a stall, opened my backpack, and retrieved the large envelope. Filled with anticipation, I pulled out some magazines. The first one had those big block letters, recognizing it was a Chris Playboy. And a second one followed in the same suit. But there was a third one with a different header, Penthouse. According to my fellow soon-to-be middle schoolers, Penthouse was where the real good stuff was. <laughs> but honestly, I didn't have a clue what the real good stuff was. So I flipped the magazine open to a random page, and to my astonishment, there was a woman sitting spread eagle, fiddling with a silver object that looked like some sort of bowling ball pin. <laughs> As a sheltered and sheepish tween, I had never considered what went into the act of sex. I had never seen any real porn in my life. Anything beyond touching boobs was way off my radar, which was devoid of dildos, vaginas, and orgasms. I tried flipping through the next few pages, but my mind started towards a meltdown. Is this what real porn was? What in the world was this woman doing? <laughs> I was so overwhelmed by the transition away from tasteful nudes, I started to panic. <laughs> Startled, I began shredding the pages of the penthouse magazine, like some sort of confidential document that needed to be destroyed, flushing the remnants down the toilet. But then the alarm of potentially clogging the toilet washed over me, so I ran out of the stall to the trash can by the restroom entrance and shoved my hand into the garbage to bury the rest of the magazine. At that moment, it hit me that I had no clue what went into sex. In fact, I was terrified. Would I be any good at sex? <laughs> my parents picked me up, and I was completely checked out. My brain was split, one half answering their questions and the other figuring out what to do with these remaining magazines. Could I hide them in a binder of baseball cards or a box for a board game? Waiting to jump out of the car, we pulled into the garage and I anxiously ran into my room. I slipped the two magazines under my mattress, not knowing that this was the same hiding place for every teenager since the dawn of time. <laughs> The coast was clear for a few days, but not even a full week later, I was in the backyard jacuzzi. And minutes later, my dad joined, which was typical. As part of his routine, he lit a cigar, sipped from a low ball filled with scotch on the rocks. And then coolly, without even looking at me, he said, where'd you get those magazines? <laughs> filled with shame, I began to shrink into my bathing suit and receded into the water. Was I about to be grounded for eternity? Or even worse, was I about to be on God's shit list? <laughs> but to my surprise, I didn't get scolded. Instead, my dad started giving me his version of the sex talk. But there was no talk of body parts. He spoke about jeans. Only years later did I find out that we weren't talking about Levi's denim. We were talking about DNA. But I was so apprehensive that I didn't dare ask how two pairs of pants were necessary to make a human being. <laughs> At the end of his genetics lecture, I gathered the courage to say I was headed for the shower. Once inside the house, I raced to my room, wondering if my parents had confiscated the Playboys. But the two magazines were sitting on my bed. Stunned, I thought to myself, was this some kind of guilt-tripping move by my parents to keep me looking over my shoulder for divine punishment? <laughs> I was torn between keeping the magazines and tossing them out. I thought it would be great sleepover material. I'd finally be in the lead of the porn arms race amongst my friends. But the Playboys didn't end up carrying much clout for long. 
At the next sleepover, my magazines were blown into smithereens by a crystal clear scene of cheesy late night porn. And after that, it was a CD burned by a friend's older brother with his top porn video hits. <laughs> Even though my sex life would eventually take off, I never really have changed. I've never stopped being that guilty, fear-stricken boy in the stalls of the, of the Toronto airport. I sometimes ask myself, do you have any clue what you're doing when it comes to the sack? Maybe I would be better off if I had just opened up that penthouse and studied it instead of tossing it into the trash. Jonathan Grinstein, everybody. Jonathan. <laughs>